click the links for Odyssey Be Shooting Coffee. And before you watch the end of the video, in the comments, tell me why you think Ripley worked in Aliens. Why she, why she was believable. Okay, now Aliens is an interesting piece because you had Paul Rasner in the role of agent of the globalist NGOs that are bigger parasites than the aliens themselves. The sort of shining a light on the parasite that is Hollywood. This is from the article in Bound into Comics, just talking about the uh, inequality that's going to be high highlighted, high lit in the uh, the new Alien show. Okay, so the thing with Aliens, before we get into that, is you think about it, it was perfectly cast, like Ghostbusters, Star Wars, and there was a bunch of films from 1975 to 1990. I'm not saying it's Shakespeare or anything, but some of these movies, they felt like they were humming along like a well-oiled machine, just for what they were, they were absolutely perfect, including some Schwarzenegger movies. Paul Reisner was a perfect scumbag. And Bill Paxton, and then you had the guy who played a robot dude, which is kind of weird when you're really good at playing a robot. One of the uh, backstories was the soulless NGO, the Luciferian globalist juggernaut that consumes human souls to line the pockets of a wealthy few um, types. I probably shouldn't name one you two. Sorcerer Childs. The main story was a reluctant hero who goes on an adventure perfectly played by Sigourney Weaver for her unique uh, capabilities because she always seemed pissed off the world and I never got the feeling that she was scared of the alien. She didn't want to get uh, consumed by the creature but she still had a cool head and the movie worked um, and I'll answer why I think it worked at the end if I remember. So the Noah Hawley of the new Aliens director, he says he wants to make this show about inequality. All right, sounds good. Let's eat the rich together. I have some ideas on how we can go forth. Somehow I don't think uh, what I have is what they have in mind. But then he makes this weird comment about Paul Reisner's character, sort of excusing him as a middle management grunt uh, with the other soldiers, which seems like he doesn't understand the character or the story at all. In Aliens, he was the agent of the evil NGO. He was an extension of its will. He took every opportunity to be a worm. So I'm not sure how he sees him as, I don't know, one of our guys. But then, how do I say this? In this new version, Paul is going to be blonde. Because, call me crazy, but I suspect Noah is a globalist, you know, Hollywood. So the story is set in the near future, so I've got to assume China will be in charge. And I know it's based on an English a Japanese company, but, you know, in the future, it's like, well, China's number one. And uh, they're going to be portrayed as the bad guys that they actually are? Probably not. I don't see anything coming out of Hollywood uh, for the next hundred years portraying China in a negative light. Because even if, if that one film you're willing to write off, you're also writing off every film from that production company, possibly from that director, possibly from that actor. So China is strictly off limits. That is the new way of the world. They are the new masters. China is a huge market, but they can never be portrayed as the bad guys, which is like, there's two billion of them, and there's a lot of stories to tell. It's just the way it's going to work. They're going to be invisible as the antagonist. Basically, every big movie is made with China in mind. And, you know, on a personal level, I don't care. I'm probably too jaded to watch anything post-2020 anyway. And there's enough stuff earlier. Um, and at some point, I'd be like, I would rather make a skit movies and entertain myself with it than, than support Hollywood. I'm like Stan in South Park who realizes that even as like an 8th grader he needs to drink to get through the day. I guess I probably realized that in high school. The next interesting point is he mentions how in the original films the corporation was faceless. Paul was their representative which is why he was perfect for the role. He was such a worm. The audience wanted to see the alien slowly eat him and his stupid vest. Or struggle, snuggle him, which is basically what that throat, um, um, R-A-P-E thing is, is doing. Um, I can't show you the original art of the artist who did the alien's original stuff, but if you're into comics, you probably know who he is already. Unfortunately, he passed away in his 70s. His stuff was uh, really, really crazy, crazy over-the-top sexual. Like, everything was just 
dripping wet phallic symbols going into you know male and female symbols um in one body uh really wild art um and good and they changed it for the movie a little bit but it's like you can look at the original art and then you look at the movie stuff and you're like oh i see where they're going with this like these are all just all these dripping wet phallic symbols and like penises going into vaginas coming out of penis it's like everything is just sex 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 but in this weird alien way because they're like they're hive-minded insects and they're uh ecto um what are exoskeletons um but then there's like human sexuality overlaid on it and it's not i know it's gonna sound weird it's not it's not creepy it's more like a fever dream that kind of works but anyway for what they did for the movie it, um what they did the movie was absolutely perfect like even this image here like if you saw that movie, I mean, of course you saw that movie, um, in a dark room, uh, you can just imagine that the feeling of when the eggs start to open up. Okay, so Paul Rasner was uh, a vile piece of garbage, but he was a representative of the company. So you're thinking, like, how evil is the company if this worm is a representative? Pretty evil. And he did an amazing... Everyone in the in, in the, the movie did amazing, amazing jobs. There was like three dozen films in, I don't know, a ten-year period that you can go look at and you're like, how the hell did they make these movies and they're not going to make them ever again? I mean, I mean, not only for your lifetime, but for like the next hundred years, movies like that with that kind of impact. Let me say this. Movies with the impact of a lot of the movies made from like 77 to um, 1990 will never be made again in human history because the environment is too different. Uh, anyway, in the new version, the corporation won't be faceless. And let me align my third eye and uh, guess that instead of Chinese or the Japanese or Indians, who are likely going to be the leaders of the future, they're going to be fat old blonde guys who look suspiciously like Trump. Maybe one of their wives will be called something similar to Melania. How do I know this? Well, look at it this way. What happens if the bad guys are Japanese, Chinese, Indian, uh, Mexicans, or even Israelis? I was thinking of, like, what countries will be here in 100 years. Like, you're going to be the leaders in the next 100 years, and it's going to be um, Japan, South Korea, Israel, and China. For reasons I can't get into on YouTube. Um, if, uh, if he made them the bad guys, uh, Netflix would probably publicly execute him for his hate crime of wrong think. And let's be real here. We all know Noah is going to be all on board the F whitey train. This also sort of gets into a weird bit about the line of Ripley saying they don't screw each other over for a percentage. But this is an interesting point of, I think, globalist propaganda. I know it's it's easy to grind that axe and like apply it everywhere, but it does seem to be much more prevalent than I uh, previously imagined, as, as is the tiresome levels. They conflate and deflect. I got into this conversation with uh, someone on social media. Her basis was that we should do something now because of something we, in quotes, did or allegedly did in our past, but I explained that, you know, not that it matters, um, but that that wasn't in my timeline. I'm a more recent immigrant to America, and I don't have anything to do with it, nor do my people in my timeline, which is mood because you're only responsible for your own acts because we live in a causal universe. And where this is in North Korea where they punish uh, a generation up and a generation down. North Korea is a fascinating study. So I say that your family may have done horrible things, but why should I be responsible for their actions? She quickly said that her family also came recently, which begs the question, if you knew that your family's ancestors didn't do anything, then why do you say that we were responsible? She didn't have an answer to that. I know it's a little bit of a weird point, but I use that to give example to one of their manipulative techniques to pretend to be part of a group to manipulate it by getting you to trust them, then casting aside their cloak of many colors and saying, actually, no, they aren't really part of that group, and thus they are blameless. So when Ripley said, we screw each other over, it makes me pause and wonder who the corporation is. Who's the CEO and executive board? Is it is it really we, or is it more likely them? 
In the first two films, Waylon and Yatani were just vaguely some globalist corporation made to sound like an English-Japanese merger. Uh, but even the writers laughed at the idea of England ever being back on its feet again to be, you know, part of the space race. Uh, England is more likely to be a second world country in a few years, but don't laugh because so is America, if not a third world Japan will be a first world country in 100 years because Japan will still be Japanese. What would an English corporation look like? It wouldn't be English. More likely, China would have the resources for this sort of thing. But the point of their role in the original film was just to point out the evils of globalist corporations, NGOs having more power than the people of a nation. Of course, in the future, there won't really be a nation of England, not in the sense that you could recognize it. It'll be more of a geographic economic zone. I think their intent was to point out the evils of capitalism, maybe, but it showed the difference between nationalist forms of capitalism versus international globalism. Be careful there, Bianca. But it wasn't so important in the first two movies, which were about Ripley being a badass. She wasn't a hot chick. She was, uh, wasn't was a man-hater. She just wanted to get the hell out of there and save the kid, at least in the second film. She was such an unusual character. She didn't seem eager for the role, but she was also very confident without being insufferable. The second film had a different vibe of tribalism than the first film because the military units were a cohesive team, cohesive? more so than the commercial shipmates who weren't getting along that well. It's a military team versus a faceless corporation and the alien. In later films, they changed the dynamic to where everyone seemed like such assholes. You were rooting for the alien to eat everybody. But now in Noah's version, he wants to examine the face of the corporation and highlight the inequality between these ultra-wealthy globalists and the salt of the earth, who will be our heroes. However, knowing Hollywood, it will be more pepper than salt. The initial story was about the Job characters uh, in a dark, cold, dangerous universe. The danger was external from alien monsters, but also from the human-appearing monsters who were behind the faceless corporation. Somewhere in the Bounding in the Comics comment section, someone t said, Take a sci-fi movie. If a story can exist just as well without the sci-fi elements, it's not sci-fi. So it looks like this story will do the same old, the humans were the real monsters all along, which might work, but in modern Hollywood, the monsters are usually going to be blonde, not Japanese, because like I said, it's supposed to be a Japanese-English uh, consortium or something like that. Okay, so if you'd answered that question, um, do you win the no prize? Oh, you might win a comic book. Um, though I guess, how, how would I know if you answered it and you didn't just change your answer afterwards? Hmm. Um, why Ripley works so well, which is a whole topic, a whole other video. But uh, uh, she's uh, five ten and a half, five eleven when she made the movie. Probably taller. She's probably thirty in her thirties when she did it, um, and she had very small breasts. And that's why she looked like she could take care of herself, and you didn't view her in your mind. She didn't imprint on your mind as young, fertile. When when men see young breasts. They just think fertile, fertile reproduce, reproducing member of the tribe. Uh, take care of, take care of, take care of. It's just there's just a biological imperative to carry the seed forward. Um, because she had small breasts and she was tall, there it didn't click in that part of the brain. And she's attractive, but she looks. I mean, attractive in the sense like she'd be an English country wife from a hundred years ago or something like that. And and yes, everything's in the right place, but she doesn't imprint on your mind that you must protect her because she's breastfeeding or she's nursing or she's gonna, she's fertile. It just doesn't imprint on that part of the mind. Just my two cents came over with, pulled it right out of my butt. If you guys have a better explanation, well, you probably do. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe, guys. I will see you all uh, next episode.